This podcast is brought to you by Aspers Casino Newcastle, home of the £4 pint on match day. That's all Newcastle home games and any televised Newcastle fixture. The offer applies from midday until midnight on all draft beers. Be gamble aware, over 18s only. Visit begambleaware.org. Uh, be drink aware and for details and T's and C's, visit aspersnewcastle.co.uk. Castle drew 1-1 one, one at home with Brighton on a sunny day at St James's Park. The last home game of the season didn't result in a much needed victory. We managed to score in every single home game this season for the first time ever. Probably, I haven't checked it out, but it just seems like the kind of thing we've never done before, at least since 1927 or something, when we were actually good. So that was nice. The result wasn't nice. You've got Cy, Charlotte and Rubenstein here to talk to you about it today. Let's get into it, though. Quite simply, Cy, have Newcastle United fucked up sixth place? It's such a it's such a brutal, abrupt question, isn't it? But maybe, probably, probably. Um, I don't think the performance yesterday was enough concern that oh we're definitely not gonna not capable of finishing six still but it was just a reminder of how up and down and how inconsistent we've been this season and now you're thinking are we really going to go and win two away games on the bounce to to seal sixth place and i'm just not so sure um you know back down to one striker who was unwell yesterday and we just didn't didn't look on it um the warmer weather doesn't seem to suit us we we seem to struggle in the heat a little bit and yeah i'm, I'm just way less convinced now that we've got got it in us to um to win at Old Trafford and then even if we do do that I think we're still gonna have to win at Brentford based on Chelsea's form and that you know we, we need to win both games and how many how many back-to-back away wins have we have we pulled together this season it just doesn't doesn't feel like a something that this current Newcastle team this season will do um I know that sounds quite negative but yeah um I feel like that yesterday was the chance to keep it in our hands and have a little bit of a buffer oh, where we could, in our hands. it is in our hands i suppose but yeah we had a little bit of a buffer where we could draw one of these three games now we have to win the next two and that's it just feels hard it feels really hard i think um just to talk about the people the the teams in that kind of race for the sixth if we're gonna call it that um man U, obviously we play man U. that's an absolutely massive game now that is it can't be understated that's going to be huge on wednesday night and chelsea and chelsea have brighton and Bournemouth, the two two of the B teams for you, Alex. And I think those are not games to be underestimated for them. Yesterday, they, you know, Nottingham Forest created a lot of chances against Ch- Chelsea. Chelsea rely very much on kind of one player having a great game and everybody else being lifted by that. And and so and like you know, it, you can look at their results and think, oh god, they're then and their fixtures and think, oh god, they're going to catch up with us. And it, I don't think it's as simple as that. I don't think I'm I'm. I'm pretty positive about this. I I think we can go away. I think we can go to um, Man U and, and beat them. They're all over the place and they've got a game today and I'm perfectly comfortable. I think I don't think it'll be easy necessarily, but I think we can do it. And then we've got Brentford at the end of the season, which I do think is a harder game. They won at the at the death of it yesterday, but um and it's at their place, which is obviously our away form hasn't been great, but I still think we can do it. And I think this is a team that really wants this and really like can pull these performances out of the bag. And I don't know if I'm just being a crazy optimist or completely blind to reality or both, but I just think we've got it in us. And also, even if we're level on points, our goal difference is so superior that that will, that will seal the deal for us. And, you know, so I'm, I'm feeling good. I think my apprehension, sorry, to, I'll just come back. I think my apprehension comes from the fact that we could get anything from zero points to six points from these two games. I, I agree. <laughs> Chelsea, so Chelsea might drop points. Man United have got a gain on us, um, uh, especially with goal difference. But I just think anything, it's, it's, I'm just not seeing any Castle team that wins both games. I think lots of other variants are, are more likely, um, including us not winning either. It, it's not unfeasible just based on the way things are. So. Um, yeah, it's a lottery. I'm not saying it can't happen. It's absolutely within our gift to still do it. I'm just less, less convinced than I ever have been. I guess I just, sorry to, I know that <laughs> Rob will get to this speak about it. This is the science Charlotte. Yeah, sorry. I guess I, yeah, I just think, um, I just think we can, I just think we will. I, I, I think, anyway, Rob, you can speak. Yeah. I'll allow it. Um, it just <laughs> felt totally Newcastle, to be honest. It, it was one of them games where things weren't quite clicking. I, I wouldn't necessarily say that we weren't totally out of it. I think on a different day, those final passes could have led to goals. And I think that just <clears throat> spoke volumes of where we are right now. And 
having that game at home. And that's the thing, I don't disagree. We've, we've gone to Manchester United and played Dummett and Kraft at the back and beat them last time round. And when the pressure's on and Eddie Howe can fire them up, I think it's totally doable. But to be, you know, a last home game of the season, to win that match would have, it wouldn't have guaranteed us anything with two games to go. You yeah. never know what's going to happen, but it would have put us in such a good spot and to now be having to even have this conversation is just just frustrating. Um, mm. Is it over? No. I think watching the Chelsea game after, I think just put the um, like the pin in even further. To be honest, the frustration by it because that could have easily ended up as a draw or even a you know the other way. We've got Man U Arsenal later on today. It's like if we'd won to yesterday, I could have happily lived my Sunday without having to look at anything else that was yeah. going. And instead now I'm going, God, what's the score for this? What's the score for that? Will Isaac be back in time for, for Man United game? So, and, and as well, I'm waking up feeling slightly hungover and sorry for myself. So I'm slightly more on size side right now, but I'm hoping that by the end of today and tomorrow, I'll be back to, to where Charlotte is. Have a coffee and yeah, then come back to I'll me. I'll wake up. <laughs> It, the, the the key thing here for me is that it is in Newcastle United's hands. If we were sat here a point behind or with the worst goal difference substantially and sort of having a substantially better goal difference, then I'd be a little bit more on the all is lost camp. There is a part of me that thinks, well, how realistic was it that Newcastle were going to win five games <laughs> in a row at the end of the season? Um, probably not very because there's a reason that these teams between sixth and eighth are vying for sixth and eighth instead of fifth to third or whatever. And the same applies to our opponents. So Chelsea and Newcastle are two of the informed teams in the league. Man United aren't, and that's before they play Man United. But even if they beat Man United, they're not one of the informed teams in the league, far from it. Man United have a lot of problems on the pitch, off the pitch, structurally, tactically, managerially. Newcastle and Chelsea probably don't. I, I understand and I agree with you, obviously, Newcastle's away form this season doesn't suggest it can go and win back-to-back -back away games, but also Newcastle are going to play a, a Man United team in disarray. And let's face it, even without the even without the issues Man United have, a point at Old Trafford is historically a good result for most teams, but particularly Newcastle United. So a point is good for Newcastle. However, they may be able to leverage, and again, we're assuming much because Man United have yet to play Arsenal, but if Man United lose to Arsenal later today or even draw against them, it's a must win for Manchester United on Wednesday. Newcastle can leverage that and can exploit that. But overall, like Rob said, you just feel that Newcastle are a team full of good players. If you think about the starting eleven, there's probably a good chance that Newcastle's last two games will feature Nick Pope, Joe Linton, possibly a bit of Mega Omron, who knows what Callum Wilson. I'd still much rather be in Newcastle's camp, yes, uh, Newcastle's camp moving forward than the other teams. And that, that we have put ourselves in that position and that has to be celebrated. Sixth place weeks and months ago seemed like a distant dream. It seemed impossible. There was a lot of conversations, January, February, even early March about eighth to 11th in the conversations were, is that acceptable? Is it good enough? Well, we're going to finish eighth probably at least, and we should finish sixth or seventh. The issue that I have about yesterday is that, one of you said it, it just feels like the life's been sucked out of everyone a bit and you don't want that to translate to the players because pre-game yesterday with the sun shining in the city, with the bars full, I got into the ground as I have to these days because the queues are so long, half an hour before kickoff. <laughs> so bad. Um, well, you know, they get some money out of me from the, <laughs> from the kiosk in the ground <laughs> yeah. where they never used to, so it's, it's, it's genius. Um, it was like an away game in the corner in the Gallagher. It was like an away game in terms of the concourse, the singing. People were so up for it. The, the, the atmosphere at the start of the game was completely electric. It just seemed like it was going to be another famous St. James's day. And then it just wasn't in that, that the energy just got sucked out of the crowd and almost a little bit out of the players. We'll talk about the actual game in the second part of the show. And you just don't want that. You know, If we'd won yesterday and it's big if, we'd have bounced into Old Trafford on Wednesday. And we should still bounce into Old Trafford because we're a better team than that, than that Manchester United team. How has yet to lose to them in the league since he took over? We are better than them. Doesn't mean we're, we're going to win, definitely, but I think we are a, an objectively better side than they are. Um, but it just feels like an opportunity lost. And if Newcastle weren't going to win five in a row, like you said, Si, it would make more sense. It would be more understandable from our perspective anyway if, if that drop-off or that points dropped had come against Man United or Brentford. 
Brighton are a bottom 10 Premier League side currently. And if you're a top six Premier League side, that you should be looking at kind of 30 points across the season or something close to it. Now, well, again, we'll talk about what Brighton did later on. But I almost feel like walking out of the ground, I was just like, this is just part of being six to eighth. You drop points when you shouldn't drop them. Chelsea, like you said, uh, Charlotte, they should have lost yesterday, in my view. Uh, Nottingham Forest, as Nottingham Forest will do, missed some easy tap-in, hilarious chances, Chris Wood being the most culpable. Um, and and, Ch- and Chelsea rode their luck and, and they got a win. They have to go to Brighton. Brighton have shown in the last two games against two good teams that they're not to be underestimated and they'll want to finish strongly in front of their home fans. And I'll say it again, how likely is it that Chelsea win five in a row to finish the season? Not that likely. So I still think we'll do it. You are all correct. It all hinges on Wednesday night, as it should. This is a good thing. You want to be involved in these incredibly consequential games at the end of the season. This is where we want to be. It, we're not maybe quite as high as would have liked, but there's a lot of mitigation. If Newcastle can put themselves in pole position, if in a sixth on the last day of the season, whatever happens, I think you could look at the manager and, and the people above them and think, you've done all right here. Because when, you know, qualification to certain tournaments, and, and let's face it, six is only currently good enough for the Europa Conference. It's only Europa League if Manchester United don't win the cup final. So it's a it's a Europa League conference spot based on the the league table finishings. So you know there's a chance Newcastle either way get Europa Conference. And I mm. think we're just going to have to be okay with that. Let's talk about Newcastle one, Brighton one. Then Rob, uh, what went wrong for Newcastle yesterday, mate? What went wrong? Well, strangely enough, we started the game well. You know, it's it's uh, it's not been us recently. It's normally we slowly progress into the game. We actually started quick. I think we mentioned just in the last part there about the the buzz of the stadium. I loved how many black and white shirts there there was. Yeah. The, the thought it was like a sea of black and white, normally with coats and whatever, as you say, with the sun. It was so such a, a great day, and until really the, the game started to kick in. I mean, in, in fairness, I don't necessarily think we we played that bad. I just think. Brighton stifled us. Mm. I think I think they um as, as much as maybe they haven't had the greatest of season, they've had their um lots of injury issues as well. I think, you know, they, they do know what they're doing. And um yesterday they just knew where to stop us. You look at Jacob Murphy, who was, you know, firing three assists in or whatever against Burnley's blooming uh, what is it, three most assists per minutes or whatever in the uh, Premier League third place, or expected assists. Uh, yesterday he couldn't but he hit a barn door like it just totally changed overnight and and I think uh, we had lots of moments in the final third like don't get me wrong Brighton could have scored a few for themselves as, mm. as well in the game but the, I think for me it was just didn't quite have that edge I know I know Isaac got taken off and, and we've spoke about this millions of times is where we are right now is we have a few very key players in that team and and, and if they're not on it it, it, it hurts everybody else like Good players make the best out of other players. And I think when an Isaac is, um, as Eddie Howe said, I think unwell, I think Bruno actually played really well. But just with those fine moments where things just didn't quite go our way. Um, and it's easy to wake up, wake up frustrated this morning. But on a different day, it could have been a different result. But it, I think it was possibly one of, one of those games. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, how much we have to... Credit the opposition Brighton here because unlike a lot of teams who came to St. James's, they had a plan Mm -hmm. and that plan was to not get pressed to death as they did in the home fixture last May uh, where they lost 4-1 at a similar stage of the season. They actually adopted the plan. I I haven't seen many teams do apart from Pep Guardiola when we went to Manchester City. We bounced into Manchester City away at the start of the season uh, and to avoid our press, he just played long balls. He kept Haaland up and kick the ball along from the goalkeeper, uh, both aerially and along the floor. Um, and Newcastle, that day they didn't have an answer and didn't particularly have an answer to it. Yesterday either, I thought it would fair play to De Zerbe. He thought, I'm going to keep four across Newcastle's back, back line. That stops any defenders from joining in the press. And then we're just going to draw everyone forward, keep the ball at the keeper's feet, and then there'll be a big gap to play the ball into. And if Fabian Schar had been playing or Sven Botman had been playing, you would probably think Newcastle are going to be able to stop that quite successfully but they weren't so you know Danny Welbeck and the lads from Brighton's uh, wings were able to come inside as Phil Foden did in the Manchester City away game and we just seemed to have no answer to it and it just seemed to there was there was no rhythm to the play I thought that the the tactics were a bit off I thought playing Gordon in the first half as a striker and then Anderson and Murphy as kind of wingers in a 4-4-2 but they were tucked in a lot so we had we had no width and any time that we 
did get some width, caused Brighton real issues down the flanks, but it just didn't happen enough. And it's just one of those games where the opposition have come and done a, a number on us and Brighton the bottom 10 side, being in really bad form. But they are a half decent team. You, you know, they're, they're, they're not terrible. And there's a lot of talk about Brighton being on the beach. Maybe they've proved the last two games against Villa and Newcastle. They're not. And that's, <laughs> we need them to maintain that as, as, as they host Chelsea on Thursday. But ultimately, it was just one of those games where, I don't know what you think, so I don't, I don't think we deserve to win. No, no, a draw was a, a fair result based on the on the game of football we saw yesterday. I mean, you could argue that um, the, there was only about 30 minutes of actual football because of the amount of time-wasting and kind of game gamesmanship, as, as some people might call it, uh, from Brighton. From from minute one, I think they, they, they came, they probably realised there was a bit of an energy in the air, certainly before the game, like you say, um, everyone rolling in from the pubs. I mean, the city was beautiful yesterday, by the way. It's glorious just coming in and seeing every pub, everyone spilling out into all the beer gardens. It's class. Um, but probably meant that everyone was just even more expecting just to have an unreal day of Newcastle smash and Brighton again. Didn't quite happen. Um, yeah, they stifled us. I think they recognised the threat of Hall and Livermento because uh, they, yeah. they kept pushing us inside. So you're right, we ended up playing quite narrow, but I think that was more because Brighton made us do that. They were like, right, We'll let them kind of play, use Kraft and Burn, who aren't really going to create anything, like you say. They, they were the ones ending up with the ball all the time, having to come through Bruno through the middle. And it just didn't... We, we created very little through both halves of football. And yet, had the better chances of the game. You know, Longstaff's header in the first half, from like a yard out, you should score. Um, Barnes has one towards the end, great chance. Um, there's not many more you can pick on, actually, because over 90 minutes, we didn't, we didn't get into the flow, but Brighton did everything they could to stop the flow, and the referee, once again, just did absolutely nothing to kind of curtail that. Every one minute it took to take a goal kick. I don't, I don't remember him even reprimanding the keeper or saying, hurry up, he just let it happen over and over again. Brighton players going down. Whenever we, we got a bit of momentum going, Brighton players going down, needing treatment. It was just, they did a bit of a job on us yesterday. Um, they recognised the threat of us. I suppose that was... It's nice to see teams coming to St James's Park scared of Newcastle again, but it's not what we need when we just couldn't get it, couldn't get it together. And um, yeah, I don't know. Something was a bit off about our performance. Maybe it was tactically. I don't know. Maybe it was just the fact that Isaac wasn't well because he certainly was quiet, and yet he still had a great chance as well in the first half yeah. where he kind of got at the end of it. That's that's the only time I remember him really touching the ball. Um, I thought Gordon was brilliant. I thought he was absolutely fine when he came inside as well. He was the only one who looked like making things happen. Um, but the rest of the team are quiet. Yeah, I think it's really interesting what you said, Rob, because I, I thought that. I thought, oh, God, we've actually started quite well here. We we, ha we aren't growing into the game. We've come out of the blocks and, and we're, we're going to kind of dominate. But, yeah, Brighton just had a, a – they were really well drilled yesterday. They had a plan. The plan was to get as many bodies behind the ball as possible whenever we had the ball, and it worked. We just could not break that down. Any time that we did use those channels, any time that Hall got the ball and we were moving up the left, they, they were crowding – the first few times we did it, they weren't sort of as on it as uh, as they ended up, and 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 then and then they sort of like wised up to that, and then it was like two players on Hall or two players on Gordon or two players on on Anderson. It was it, and it was really tough, so tight. They were playing so tightly. It was very very tough for us to 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 move the ball up the pitch, and we didn't have an answer for it. Like it wasn't. We didn't make any kind of substitutions. I think that's maybe my main gripe is not how we started necessarily I sort of expected us to start in that kind of formation but I think my main gripe with what happened yesterday and with the caveat that it was 1-1 1-1 one okay but where we are in the season we really really wanted that to be a win and just to make everything a bit easier and Brighton are a, a, a like quote unquote lesser side than us so we should be winning these games um I, I, I just I don't really get the three man substitution at 65 minutes. I, I don't really understand why that, that happened. And then it moved, like it moved Gordon, who I thought had been quite effective um, where he was. Um, it moved him more in and, and obviously it took Isak off. I understand why you've taken Isak off. He was having an off day and he wasn't feeling well throughout the week. I get that. That's fine. But I also think um, it wasn't working well before that. Yes, Sean Longstaff's goal in extra time in, in the first half kind of I, I almost felt that kind of masked um, the need for changes um, soon, like, I, I felt like there should have been halftime changes. I know we almost never do that. And so why would we in this game? But... Jacob Murphy wasn't uh, or, or, or miss, he was missing every pass or just not making runs and things like that. He did try a little bit harder in the second half, but then he was hooked. And I just, I just didn't understand why the changes were made at the time they were made all at once and sort of what effect that was supposed to have on the game. Because to me, it didn't really have much of one. 
I, my answer to that was I thought they all looked really rusty. If I'm being yeah, honest, when they true. came on, I thought Jolinton came on and he, it's nice to see him back and he has a big presence again. But in terms of on the ball, he wasn't quite at it. And that's fine. Again, he's been out since January. He just His passing was a bit off and he wasn't really contributing to it to us an attacking sense. Um, I totally agree with Murphy. He should have been off at half time. I just, something wasn't right about his performance. Um, you know, I, I have absolutely so much respect for him and, and the, the work he's done for us, but he wasn't working hard yesterday. He wasn't making runs. He didn't seem to want the ball. The ball was coming to him and he was just offloading it really quickly. He just didn't seem to want to contribute. That said, I was screaming for Miggy to come on and he didn't really <laughs> impact the game either because because you're right, the, the triple sub should have had some sort of impact on the game and it didn't feel like it did. I suppose Barnes had that one big chance, but other than that, I can't really remember him doing anything either. So. I mean, it's a triple sub people were probably crying out for, maybe a bit earlier, but it didn't change anything. And I, I can't quite put my finger on it, but I think it's just because two of those three lads are a bit rusty and weren't quite, they're not the impact subs yet. Hopefully 30 minutes under their belt is massive for, for Wednesday because you, you kind of want to see Joe Litton back in the team, don't you? Um, I would also say Anderson was at fault for their goal. Uh, you know, he just loses his man and doesn't really handle that situation very well. Like I also think Murphy, who gets himself back on the line and just still fails to block the shot, it's like... It's Sunday league, if you if you kind of mark mark in the post and you, you end up on the line, you just have to get your body in the way and stop it going in. And yeah, I don't know what Dubravka was doing. Um, other than that, I'll say it again, I don't think Brighton really did anything else. And it was just one of those games of a few chances, probably because of the heat, probably because of the, the stop-start nature of it. Um, and yeah, we just didn't take our three or four chances that we got. Just very quickly again, on the subs, to your point there, of, of they didn't really make an impact... I don't understand why it wasn't staggered. Like doing it as I understand that that we've done like a, a wholesale kind of change many times a season. But I think for those players, especially ones who have have not got loads of minutes under their belt, stagger that. Get the team that's already on the pitch knowing where those players are going to come on and how it's going to impact the game. Get them playing together, and then actually, even every, like in five minute increments, it also offers us the chance to. Um, sort of stop the game a little bit because to your earlier point Si um, Brighton were doing that going down at every opportunity taking a million years for every goal kick like it, uh, we weren't particularly creative we weren't particularly um, inspiring going forward so if you if you do that you you offer a chance to kind of you know send some notes onto the pitch send like change the game ever so tweak the game ever so slightly and that's kind of what i hoped for yesterday and it just didn't happen i think he, um i think in fairness to eddie Howe, i think that's you you wanted it to change i think because the game wasn't going right mm. you almost thought it's almost like right let's just change the team let's just mm. put three and if, and that that was you know what 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 did go wrong was that joe linton come, came on and just looked a little bit you know a step behind and and barnes didn't quite get there so it was Eddie Howe does kind of like doing these kind of like big changes all in one go. And, and I think yesterday was in a way kind of let's let's actually just change it. Let's change the side because the team currently out there and what we're currently doing isn't working. It just so happened that when we made those changes, it, it didn't really change an awful lot, unfortunately. We'll talk about some things that did go right yesterday or one person in particular. I thought Lewis Hall had another superb game. He really does look like a £28 million pound sensation youth center uh, left back at the minute you know he's so he reads the game so well he's able to contribute um attacking wise and defensively got a little bit lucky actually he was on a yellow card and then he he kind of barred someone off the ball who was through on goal but it didn't even make the highlights so you know <laughs> oh, well, there you go. fine um but yeah I, d I just think his emergence at the end of this season cause I don't want to get back into Dan Byrne left back debates, but I also just don't ever want to see him play left back again. Um, he's a good second choice centre back for Newcastle, currently first choice because of injury. Maybe you can even, you know, push Sven Botman for first choice. I'm fine with that um, starting next season. But I, I do think, I think a lot of people are really keen on both full backs, but I think that Livermento yesterday had a more difficult game, mm. got rinsed a couple of times, got left for dead a couple of times. I think Byrne just looks more assured in his position than. Livermento does, albeit Livermento does have, I'd say, in my opinion, much worse players ahead of him technically than um, Hall does on the left-hand side. But that, that is definitely one of the, the the promising things to come from the end of the season is so many questions about Lewis Hall throughout the season. Why have we done this? Why won't Hal play him? Why won't he? Why have we uh, committed so much money to a player who can't get in the team when we've got all of these injuries? To me, it looks like Newcastle's guaranteed starting left-back at the start of next season. Thoughts from anyone? Yeah, I thought all was good. I I, I do agree, and it's it's funny because I, I was like many questioning what 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 is going on with Lewis Hall. Um, 
on the ball, he's just, he's, well, listen, well, whether he was a further forward player, like left mid and even centre mid and now playing left back, you can tell, to be honest, because he's very comfortable on the ball, very comfortable bringing the ball out. I think in games like when we had the, when he came on against West Ham, when we had like the, t the turn of the tide and we had all the ball against um, teams like Burnley, when we have a lot of the ball, I thought yesterday when, we, when he had his chance, you know, he, he didn't have too much threat, so he was free to use the ball. I think that side of his game is spot on and I think the way Eddie Howe's using him right now is, is perfect. The only thing I would say is that, um, and this is what Eddie Howe pretty much alluded to, was like defensively still learning. I think at the moment we've kind of played him in those games where he has been able to kind of look after himself. But then there's, not, there's nothing bad about, you know, actually this is going to be a tough game. I know you don't want me to say it, but we will put Dan Byrne at left back for that one game. Or we will, you know get Target out the like the cupboard or wherever he is and play him in the game. <laughs> like at, at the minute, it, it it's it's nice to have that. And that, that's the hope is across the end of this season and next season, his whole will learn a little bit more defensively and then we can rely on him more and more. So yes, it's, um, I think it's a, a bit of a happy ending to the whole season because after probably for him as well, sitting thinking I've been brought here and I don't know what's going on and now I'll be kind of seeing not just game time, but, praise and um, I think people are happy for him so yeah he was really good um, Bruno Gamarge at the end of the game set a few tongues wagging I tend to think it's more just as general complete um, devastation at not winning games of football he's, yeah, such a, he does he's, every such, week. he's such a winner but yeah society people are kind of viewing him being sitting by himself a little bit being apart from the rest of the group looking generally miserable as, as sadness at not winning his last home game what do you think uh, yeah, I don't want to read too much into it. There's still loads to play for. Now, I think he said the same himself, to be fair. So, you know, he's, he's definitely not sitting sulk and saying, well, that's that then. Um, he is very, he's very much a, um, a, a winner, you know, so losing games of football, like I say, seems to affect him more than, more than uh, others. And that's absolutely fine. That's what you want from your football. You want them to be good and we lose football games. You want them to be absolutely furious that we haven't taken the three points. Um, whether that should be any indication of his, of his future intentions, I don't know. I don't know because I, I I do think that the what based on the discussion we had in the first half of this podcast, if we don't get Europe or if we don't even get conference, he might he might go. Um, if there's someone who's willing to pay the money, um, and that might not be the hundred, it might be whatever we're offered after that release clause expires. Um, he does look like a player or sounds like a player who thinks he's <laughs> thinks he's better than this and I, I, that's fine as well he, he clearly thinks he is he's good enough to to play at the, the highest level of football and he doesn't want to be playing drawn games at home to brighton drawn games against you know luton he wants to be winning football matches and and playing against the best um and and proving himself totally get that so he he needs the rest of the team to catch up with him again because i think he's been he's stood out more this season than he did last season because i think everyone else was closer to his level last year whereas i think on a lot of occasions this season the gulf between his ability and those around him has been a bit more evident. And maybe he's a bit frustrated at that and constantly like looking up and he's got long staff kind of just sort of floating around and not, not doing as much. Um, he hasn't had his pal Joe Linton in the team as much, I suppose it doesn't help, but yeah, I don't know. It's very hard to read because if he, if he scores a winning goal, it'll draft it next week. He'll look like he absolutely loves the club and he'd be kissing the badge and everything else. So it's, it's a hard one, but yeah, the, I understand the, the why the, the, the tongues are a wagging as you, as you said, uh, because it's, it, it is a talking point. Isn't it only this season that he pointed to the badge and went, I'm staying? It was, was it this season? Do you not remember? Yeah, I think he, he did that. He scored a goal and yeah. he went, I'm staying. Um, so why would he lie? <laughs> That's all I want to know. Why would he lie <laughs> six months ago about, about this? I don't know. Maybe we were fifth or fourth. At the yeah, time. maybe. Um, I, I, think, I think people are keen to read into it. We, much has been made in the press about this release clause, about the money, about, you know, and, and Bruno is... He is an excellent player. He is an elite player who wants to be playing at the top of, of football in general. So he probably wants to be in the Champions League. Um, by all accounts, it, nothing would really turn his head apart from potentially City or potentially La Liga, maybe. Um, and that would, you know, gain us money. But I, I, I don't think anything actually has come out about approaches made to the club, about um, about offers being made. So... I don't think he knows he's leaving. I don't think he's sat apart from the, the group because he wants to make a statement to Newcastle fans. I think he's just there, to your point, because we didn't win the game and it's 
wife and kids are there and he's just walking around. Maybe he's tired. He ran a lot yesterday. He, put, he did a lot of work yesterday. Maybe his legs are slower than the rest of the team's <laughs> legs. Like maybe it's as simple as that. Yeah, Bruno definitely wears his heart on his sleeve. And I think it, it comes with it comes with two sides because we can talk about him being like, you know, a, a, a favourite of the fans because of how good he is at football. But I think as, as much as he is, he's a good footballer. It's because of the emotion he displays. Mm. It's because he's constantly kissing his badge. He was, um, as Eddie Howe was saying, he was having um, lunch with the Newcastle under eights team. Like he's he's very out there. He's very, um, um, very kind of live, living his life to kind of enjoy and with the fans. And and then and then the other side of that is is that when he does something more public that maybe isn't the I love this and I love that. It's it's very, you know, if, I don't know, Shaw, you know, Shaw isn't necessarily the most emotional person on or off the field. If if Shaw was walking a few paces behind, I don't think anyone would notice or even talk about it. But <laughs> because it's Bruno and because he's so out there and it's so obvious, it's, and, and because he's got that relationship with the fans, people almost want to talk about it and read into it. It's, um, for, for me, I, I, I wouldn't read into it too much. I think a lot of what Bruno does is very in the moment and it's kind of there and he's and he's in it. And I, I think what one of you said, I think it was just because we didn't win the game, to be honest. I think he was just, it was the last game of the season, to be fair. So it was a big game. And I think someone like him probably will take it to heart, to be honest. And that's the way I saw it anyway. That will do us for today. Thank you so much for watching. This podcast is brought to you by Aspers Casino Newcastle, home of the four pound pint on match day. That's all Newcastle home games and any televised Newcastle fixture. The offer applies from midday until midnight on all draft beers. Be Gamble Aware, over 18s only. Visit BeGambleAware.org. Uh, be Drink Aware and for details and T's and C's, visit AspersNewcastle.co.uk.